So for personal, I would I would have my Twitter profile be this. It would be um, father, husband, uh, who loves to read, loves to ski, likes 80s music, and right. thinks he's funnier than he really is. All right. That's my personal <laughs> one. And, and then for, for the podcast, the podcast is, is, is this. So co-host of an award-winning behavioral science podcast called Behavioral Grooves explores why we do what we do with researchers, authors, practitioners, and accidental behavioral scientists. Right. And who thinks he's funnier than he really yeah. is. Then I get a little bit more. This is for my business. This is a uh, lantern oh. group. And so for this one, I would say sought after speaker and consultant applying behavioral science insights to increase business performance, helping you understand your customer and employees better. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of Jagged with Just Ravi. Conversations at the Edge with thought leaders from the marketing, branding, and the business world. And hi, Kurt. It's so great to have you on my show. I am excited to be here. I am uh, really looking forward to this. Yeah, so it's great awesome. to have you, Dr. Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, I, I only make oh, my, my enemies <laughs> call me doctor, so you guys can just call me Kurt. There you go. <laughs> okay. So coming to behavioral psychology, uh, Kurt, could you share examples of how behavioral psychology can be applied to the field of marketing and advertising? For example, behavioral priming, how it is used in marketing for increasing online conversions on a website or use of leading questions in market research. Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. Use of colors on a logo. Like yeah. That. So, so there's lots of, this is a really interesting part and in behavioral science has done a, f a figuratively large amount of work, particularly as it relates to web design. It's been one of the ones where the, those people have, have adopted behavioral science principles really um, strongly. And so they've, they've been using it. I, I will go back. So just from a web design piece, um, behavioral priming is the, the idea that things that are below maybe our conscious level or just at that level of consciousness that we see it, but it doesn't really register mm -hmm. um, for us impacts are the way that we, we think that it, it, it uh, as they say, it activates neural pathways within our brain that lend our thinking down a certain, that makes it easier for our thoughts to go down a certain pathway versus another pathway. So if, if a pathway, you know, again, the way that we think is neural neurons fire, various different connections make, and that's how we think. And if certain of those are activated, they're easier to, to trigger. And so therefore we we go down different pathways on that. That's for instance, if I said, um, I give you this idea and I, I start talking about lunch and I start talking about all the great food that we have. And I say, hey, here's, give me, uh, what's a word that starts with S, has two letters in the middle and ends with P. And then if I say that after having just talked about lunch, most people, not everybody, will guess soup, right? Um, but if I had talked about oh, hey, you know, I need to clean myself. I like to take a bath. I'm going to be doing, you know, I want to make sure that I, I get all the germs done in various different pieces. And I say, what's a word that starts with S, two, two letters in the middle and ends with P? People will more likely say soap, right? So the, that's the priming part of this, right? So it's the same S, two letters, P. And, but because I've, I've talked about either food up front or about cleanliness up front, you're more likely to go down one of those neural pathways. Same thing can happen from a marketing and, and thinking about this from like website design. Bob Cialdini, who is one of the, the grand masters of behavioral science, uh, they call him the grandfather of influence. If you haven't read his book, you should. It's called Influence. It's great. Um, but he talks about these websites and they did this experiment. It was a furniture, web, uh, furniture uh, store that had a website. So they were selling furniture. And the landing page, they did this experiment where uh, one, one of the landing pages, just the background, right? So not the words, nothing else changed. They just changed the background. One of them had pictures of, of fluffy clouds, right? Little white clouds on a blue background. 
And one of them, then they, 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 they looked at that and they looked at what people bought for there, but then they switched it up and they put one that had uh, dollar signs. So it was American. So they had dollar signs in the background and all this money kind of pieces. And again, same exact copy. Everything else was the same. It was only at the front page that they had those two different backgrounds going. When they looked at the results from that, the people who saw the clouds ended up buying furniture that was uh, deemed to be more comfortable, that was more soft, luxurious, often had a higher profit margin because it was various different pieces of that. When they had shown the people that had been logged on with the money sign um, purchase, they were more focused in on cost. So they were more cost conscious. And there was a significant difference in what people bought when, in fact, if you go that should the clouds or money in the background make any difference to whether I buy a, a soft recliner or a cheap, you know, hard recliner. And when we think about it, that shouldn't impact my buying decision. My buying decision should be made because I want a recliner that is comfortable and fits within these budgetary guidelines. But because they're primed for those factors, it actually does. It sends our, our brains down certain ways. And so we tend to look at different types of furniture and have different things that are more primed for us so that we are more likely to, to, pay attention to the various different facets, so. Right, <clears throat> power of social proof. You know, if you could share examples how that is being used, you know, for like uh, online customer reviews, you know, celebrity expert endorsement, you know, because. Yeah, so social proof is a really interesting piece. Um, we like to think that we're individuals, right? That, that my decisions are made by me because of my preferences, because of what I like. And all of the research, and this is really powerful. This, this research goes back hundreds of years that looks at the, the power that others have to influence us. And as much as we like to think that we're very individualistic in our decisions and, and what we, we like, it's actually been shown that no, we uh, follow the crowd, right? We, we follow what other people are doing and the more specific and, and in particular, our reference group. So each of us have different reference groups that we, uh, groups that we either think that we belong to or that we aspire to belong to. And so in those instances, when we see those people doing things, that is an indicator for us that we should be doing those things as well. So again, you're talking about having a, a celebrity or, or just saying how many people have bought something. Uh, those are actually really good indicators for people. Um, the, one of the amazing things about the internet that has come in all the shopping sites and various different aspects is the ratings, right? You get, you can, five star, four star, three star. So those are right there. Those are indicators that there is some social proof going on. If you have a high star rating and you have a, a high number of those, I am more likely to go, oh, this is a good product. This is something that I should be able to, that I should like. And so there's a trust element that comes with that. Now, I'll go back to Bob Cialdini, who's just done some really cool recent research, as he said that, um, there's actually a problem with the with the the star ratings because if you get a lot of star ratings and it's at a 5.0 there's a there's a trust factor that comes in you go oh that's usually not how that works and if you have all fives maybe you're gaming the system maybe you're paying people to to write positive reviews for you maybe you get all your friends and family to go out there and everybody write in a five whatever it would be and he said that actually, if you have a four between a 4.2 and a 4.7 is the sweet spot. So it's high. It's, it's, you know, this is a good product. Um, but yeah, there's some people that are, are not so positive on it. And so that lends more credibility to that. So that's one of the, the social proof aspects right. of that. That's human and that's believable. So. Yeah. So in that, I think is there a, is there a role of familiarity also? For example, if you are say part of the same religion, then I 
associate with the symbols that you use and also we may have the same common holy book and we might actually have the same festivals so yep. you know, uh, how how big a role something like being familiar with something or being sort of used to something of trying trying to identify with something plays in that yeah that that's a big piece and there's a couple different factors that go into it and we could we could spend an entire you know segment on on this but there's this element of in group versus out group um, which has been again studied for a long time by social psychologists this idea that hey if you're in the in group with me i like you better i trust you more uh, i i think that you're a better person if you're in the out group uh, you know, you're untrustworthy, you're uglier, you're meaner, there's all sorts of different factors. And they did really cool research on this. Them versus us. Them versus, uh, them us. versus us. Yes, exactly. They yeah. did some really cool research on this. Then, And we go, oh, well, in groups and out groups are really hard to form. And they're, they're not. They did research with kids, basically. And they, they had kids on a playground and they gave some kids red t-shirts and some kids blue t-shirts. Mm -hmm. And literally they were all playing together before that they gave them these t-shirts and within two or three minutes, they started asking them about the kids with the blue t-shirts. They were just playing with those kids, right? But no, now if I'm in a, if in a red t-shirt and I'm looking at the kids with blue t-shirts, they're, they're not as smart. They're not as fast. They're not as good. And all the people with the red t-shirts are great and different, you know, all it happens right away. It's a human, it, it's as we've talked about, we haven't changed much. And this was an evolutionary thing. The people that um, are around us that we know are less likely to kill me. Right there, I'm, I'm I'm more likely to survive because I, I know these people, and so that happens to across a variety of, of of factors as you're thinking about this. So the familiarity is a piece that we trust those people more in various different aspects. There's also an aspect in in behavioral science is called the mere exposure effect, and the mere exposure effect is this concept that the more that we see something, regardless of what we feel about it at the beginning. The more that we see it, the more that we tend to like it um, and believe it. So this is one of those things with a lot of, you know, you, you hear about fake news and misinformation going out there. Well, oftentimes it gets believed because it's just so prevalent and it just is out there so much that the we saw it, didn't necessarily believe it. We, we see it again. We see it again. We see it again. We see it again. And somewhere in the back of our brains, not necessarily at a conscious level, it just starts getting, oh, it's familiar. It's as you said, it's familiar. So it must be true. Oh, I must like it better. Same thing with products. It's and you, as marketers and different pieces, you, you know that, right? There, it's very hard to, to get people to like a product or a brand if you just tell them about something once, right? You need to have a, a, a campaign that goes and touches them. And if you can touch them in different areas. So it isn't always a television advertisement, that it's a television advertisement, it's a billboard, it's uh, maybe something on social media, maybe their friends say, hey, I got this, this, you know, all of a sudden, if you get multiple different touch points, it actually, that mere exposure effect becomes even more powerful. And so people like that. More. That's one thing you just, you have also behaviorally primed us by putting a whole lot of books behind you so that we assume <laughs> that you are, you're very intelligent, very scholarly. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't read any of those. I don't know. They're, they're just, they're, they're yeah, just priming. up there. It's <laughs> like, yeah. This is Kurt trying to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Not doing a good job either, right? There no, we go. No. Yeah. So, Kurt, what about loss uh, aversion in shaping marketing offers? If you could share some examples there in driving conversions, etc. Yeah. So, loss aversion is this concept that uh, we generally this again. All of these are generalities, and so in any individual instance, it may not take place. But in general, that we uh, feel the hurt or the pain of a loss much more than the pleasure that we get from a equivalent gain. So in other words, if I um, find $10 on, on the ground, I go, woo, $10, this is great. Um, I feel a certain amount of pleasure from that. But if I were to go and, and go in my pocket and go, I had $10 in here, it's gone. Where, where did that 10, that $10 that I just found, I put it in my pocket, I go to the store, I go and I'm pulling it out to go buy something and it's gone. The pain of losing that is going to be, as the research shows, it's usually about two times as much 
as the, the equivalent pleasure that I get. And that goes to a number of different factors. It goes to, you know, things, but it also goes to like relationships, like, right. The idea that I have this, I found this new friend versus losing an old uh, dear friend, like some, you know, again, the pain of loss when we lose a, a, a close one to us, various different facets of that. So again, generalities and not on, on every individual one, but from a marketing perspective, that there's an element of, of loss that comes with scarcity. So I might lose the opportunity to buy something if there's only one left. I might, uh, you know, if there's a sale going on, but the sale ends at a certain point, right? That is going to tap into that, that loss aversion. So Ooh, I I won't I'll lose that money I, I'll, I'll lose that savings if I if I don't operate on this quickly. Another way of doing this, and this is a really I, I love this study. So they did uh, this research with uh, university students, and they wanted to get university students to register early, right? They wanted people to register before August first, and so what they did is they sent out two different emails to, they split the group in half of the university students that were going to, they were going to communicate to. And for half of them, they said, register before August 1st and get a 15% discount. Okay. So register before August 1st, get a 15% discount. The other half of the group, they sent a a message that said, register after August 1st and pay a 15% penalty. So economically, it's exactly the same. There should be, if, if I'm a classical economist and I'm going, but it costs exactly the same before August 1st for either message and the same after August 1st for either message, it shouldn't, the message itself shouldn't matter. I should just look at the dollars and figure that out. The fact of the matter is that's not how we operate. And so what they found is that when they gave the discount, so 15% discount before August 1st, they had 60 don't quote me on these. I think it was 67% of the people registered early. When they gave the, the penalty, it was 93% of the people registered early. So pretty, pretty big difference. So again, from a marketing perspective, how are you framing your messages? Are you framing them as a gain? Are you framing them as a loss? And not just loss and, and, and um, gain, but all sorts of different things. Are you framing them from a personal perspective, from a broad perspective? Are you doing different pieces? And all of those come into play. And individually, they might be five or 10% difference in, in how people respond, but that five or 10% can mean a huge amount, particularly when you go to scale. So that's where you're going with that. And again, I will caution people, don't just use a loss uh, message because sometimes particularly uh, depending upon the culture and depending upon where people are psychologically, a loss message can actually backfire. So you, so it's not just using more loss messages in your marketing. Be you have to be very concerned about where people are and the the structure and the context of everything that's happening. Yeah. So I think uh, there's one more question in marketing before we go to our fun section. So you know. Okay. Yeah. So. This is about, you know, you mentioned things about, you know, human being, you know, being the same for the last 50,000 years and this instinct for survival. And, you know, Mm -hmm. and we find that, you know, uh, even things like the placebo effect, for example, you know, in in our ability not to heal ourselves and wait for an external, you know, source to, you know, trigger our cure and all that. And a marketer in the marketing domain, it means that, you know, people tend to value stuff, which is, which, which is, let's say, more expensive or. And similarly, the marketers have used that to, you know, sort of put things in in very expensive looking packaging to connote yep. better quality and all that. So uh, how, what are your sort of, you know, what is your observations and what are your, you know, insights on this uh, effect? So one of my favorite um, aspects of this, I think, is this idea that the placebo effect is somehow fake, that it, it that, that there's something, it's not real. So it doesn't really matter, right? The idea that I give you a sugar pill and you feel better, right? There's, there's something about that that just doesn't seem right for most people. <coughs> Excuse me. But there, the fact of the matter is, is that I go back to our brains. Our brains are funny. They try to trick us all the time. Um, and our brains will trick us. So 
there's a there's a lot of really great studies with food and wine and and different things all those blind taste tests right that that people do various different pieces and one of my favorite studies is this one with wine they basically took this cheap wine and they they gave people uh two different glasses it was the exact same wine and in in one glass they said this is a ten dollar bottle of wine all right and then in another glass, the same wine, right, from the same bottle, they said, this is a $90 bottle of wine. And they had people, you know, taste it. And of course, when they tasted it, they said, oh, the $90 bottle of dollar wine tastes better. And you go, but it's the same wine. Why did that matter? And so people go, oh, that's, that's just being silly and it's a fake kind of thing. But they did the same experiment and they put people into an fMRI, which measures your brain and, and different where uh, the areas of your brain that get activated um, at different, different pieces. And they did that exact same experiment with people in an fMRI machine. And what they found, and this is, I think, really key, is that the areas of your brain that lit up when you had the $10 bottle of wine suppose, you know, glass were different than the ones that were activated when you thought it was a $90 bottle of wine. So your brain is actually processing that wine differently. It is demonstrably different for how you taste it and how you perceive it. So the quality of the wine, which you think should just be a determinant of the grapes and the process, you know, how they, they put it together But that's not it. The quality of the wine is actually dependent upon what our expectations of that wine are. And that plays out in a number of other factors as well. When we think about products and we think about marketing, how do we, what are the salient points that we are are talking about? So again, going back to what I talked about with the clouds and the, and the money for the landing page, Mm -hmm. right? Those get activated. We act Activate different things by what we talk about in our marketing. If we don't. you can't take uh, you know something that's really bad and just by marketing make it really good, right? There is a if that ten dollar wine was really horrible, there people are going to spit it out and do different pieces of it. But where there's some area of gray, that ambiguity, the way that you talk about something, the way that you brand it, the the messages that you instill within people will actually impact their consumption of it and can make a big difference in what they feel and think. So I think it's a really key piece. And it's one of those fascinating areas of behavioral science um, that ties in, I think, in real world situations in ways that we didn't necessarily always connect all the dots before. And I think we're just starting to go there. Right. And then the other thing which I sort of, you know, noticed was that, you know, even if you know that this is going to happen and even if you're aware of it, that this placebo effect is going to happen. For example, there was a lockdown in Mumbai and there were two types of vodka available. And I knew there were two different, there wasn't much difference between these two vodkas, but I, I got the cheaper one because that was the available. But every time I drank the cheaper one, even if I knew that it's as good as the more expensive one, I wasn't feeling as satisfied. So even if yeah. I was aware of it, it was, the brain still managed to trick me. So despite all my knowledge, it doesn't help you know, if I know the placebo effect is going to work on me. Yeah. I mean, and that's, 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 they did another interesting thing with like energy drinks. And again, they same energy drink and they told people this, they told people that it was the exact same energy drink. One was for 89 cents and one was for $2. And then when they studied people afterwards, and uh, like the output that they did, they, it was again, it was a lab study of the output that they did. When you had the $2 energy drink, they, they had a higher output because they thought that the energy drink was, you know, more, it, it impacted them more. And they knew it. They knew that it was the exact same as, as these other. Anyway, so it's, um, it, it's, but, it's fascinating uh, stuff. Yeah. Does it boil down to really, really deeply understanding your consumer as an individual and their beliefs because any which ways they are going to be working. So you might as well make them work for you, uh, for your offering. I mean, yeah, I think you, you hit, you hit this in a really interesting way, right? We are, we are impacted by these aspects of how we operate as humans. 
right? We have biases, we have heuristics, we have, uh, you know, impacts from society, social proof, all of those factors that we've talked about here, plus plethora of, of others. And those are impacting us on everyday day things. And I will, uh, there's a, there's a book called Nudge. You guys have probably heard of it, Richard Thaler yeah. and Cass Sunstein. And they talk about, you know, the way that things are set up, uh, impact how we do something. So in other words, if I have a, uh, they, they did a wonderful thing about uh, driver's license and, and organ donation, right? So when you sign up for your driver's license in many countries or sign up for other things, they have a thing that do you want to, if you get in an accident um, and you die, would you donate your organs? And there's a vast difference in, in different countries than they were looking in Western Europe, like Germany and Austria, Germany was really, really low. Like 20% of people said yes on that. Whereas Austria, it was like in 93%. I might've gotten those reversed. Mm -hmm. And the, they're going, why is that different? The, the cultures are pretty similar. You know, there's, there's not much difference between those two cultures. If you're thinking that would lend itself to that big of a difference. And what they found was that in Austria, it was, you had to check the box if you didn't want your organ donated. And in Germany, you had to check the box if you wanted to donate your, your um, or organ. It's a thing called choice architecture. Yeah. And so this idea of setting things up to, to play to our natural tendencies, you still have a choice, right? And one of the things that, that Thaler and Sunstein talk about is you still have a choice. It's just we know that people tend to not, you know, whatever is the default is more likely to happen than if we actually have to do, it's not much, you make a check mark, right? How much effort is that? Not much at all, but it makes a big difference as you can see in, in that example. That being said, so there's lots of factors like that. So if you understand that you can design your marketing, your advertising, your products, whatever it would be in order to take advantage of that. What you don't wanna do and this is the thing that behavioral science has to deal with from ethics. I think marketing and advertising, same thing, is you don't want to trick people. You don't want to make them do things that are not in their best interest. And so how do you do this in a way that is ethical, that provides value for the organization, but also is value for them, or at least gives them the option to say, yes, we, we, I, I don't want to do this. And so I will have a different way of doing it. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm like, I'm gonna get shot. You need like, to be shot. Yeah. Let's, let's get over this then. <laughs> Your favorite personal possession? Uh, my phone. Yeah. Alternate, alternate profession could have been a uh, professional basketball player. No, um, <laughs> short <laughs> writer, writer. I would have loved to have been a, a playwright. Oh, nice. Okay. If you could be any animal, what would that be? And what? Can I pick two? Yeah. Okay. Oh, lovely. Okay. Why not? <laughs> All right. A, a cheetah. Okay. And an eagle. Those would be the two. Right. Land Why? and land and sky. What would you do on Mars? Mars for fun. Planet Mars. On Mars? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does Mars have uh, less gravity? Because oh, sorry, I was just trying to. If it has less gravity, I would be jumping. It'd be like really cool to be able to jump high like the moon. I don't know if Mars has. I'd climb uh, Olympus Mons, which is the tallest. Uh, the uh, volcano in the solar system as far as we know oh, so. okay mm. your most often used phrase i don't know okay. is this the phrase okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know okay. okay your favorite food cuisine ice cream <laughs> is that that's a cuisine right i mean it's an entire yeah, I get yeah, yeah, it's different ice creams thing, yeah. in there i mean it's a market segment that believe so yeah so <laughs> i i you could eat if i had one um, i can't elaborate <laughs> we'll come back to this okay uh are you into avengers and superheroes your favorite avenger slash superhero 
Ooh. Let it go. I think it's too hard. I was like, cut your super superpowers. My superpower? My if I had to pick a superpower? No, no, the the one that you already have. Oh, the one that I already have. <laughs> um. Uh, oh God! Now I'm all flustered. I got shot. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, intentional. Yeah. <laughs> my superpower is uh to translate um research into everyday um understanding super okay um, i feel proud about that for some reason i don't know why. Yeah, yeah. that should make you a lot of money also yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, i wish i wish i'm not as good at it as i think right okay. there you go <laughs> okay um a book you'd like to gift to all your friends behave by robert sapolsky What would you tell your 18 year old self? You're going to lose your hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mom's best advice. You can that that you uh can do whatever you want as long as you're willing to pay the consequences. Okay. Great advice. Great yeah, advice. Yeah. What's next, Kurt? What's next? uh breakfast for me um <laughs> no uh a <laughs> breakfast of ice cream <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome <laughs> that would be you know if i didn't want to uh, i i'm not that i'm spelt or anything but i would love to have breakfast of ice cream but that would not do good for my my overall um what's next i think for for me uh being able to bring behavioral science insights to more and more people because i think it's just something that's valuable for everybody and i think it's a not well understood your time okay. all right so i think i think now you can just uh, tell us a little bit to about to our audiences about your company and where they can find you online and your oh. podcast the behavioral groups uh, you know can you just sort of give them a little bit sort of you know background and stuff like that yeah so uh, i mean if you're interested in behavior science and and some of these insights we we have a podcast that has been going on for a number of years now 240 episodes 230 episodes somewhere in there where we talk to we talk to researchers and authors and practitioners and what we call accidental behavioral scientists who uh all about trying to take these behavior science concepts and apply them to either your work or to your life and so uh we try to make it fun my co-host Tim Hulhan and myself we like to laugh a lot if you haven't told we you know we we both think we're we're pretty funny even though we okay. might not be um from a work perspective uh the company is Lantern Group we're behavioral we're a communication behavioral um design consultancy so we work with companies on applying behavioral science principles inside their work and with their consumers and so again you just lanterngroup.com there i am make sure that you like this subscribe to this because you're going to get great value out of anything that you hear here